Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. And today our topic matter is antibiotics. Friend or foe? I've seen this rash um, prescription or, or a rash amount of usage of antibiotics in my customers that have been coming into the store to grab their um, probiotics or acidophilus. None of which have been recommended by doctors except for one physician in the whole town. Um, I, I'm seeing so much of a rash of this. In addition, the side effects that are going along with this long term wise that maybe the physicians may not be seeing that I thought this would be a good topic to address to make you or help you be more aware of what the ramifications, what the side effects are, the, the benefits and the problems with taking antibiotics. They were developed in the late 1930s, early 1940s, and obviously with tuber tuberculosis and some of the E. coli bacteria that were around that were very simple back then compared to how they are now, they were found to be very, very effective against these what people deemed as heavy bacterial infections, um, oftentimes that would kill people. Um, at that time, there wasn't a whole lot of naturopathic or alternative medicine being practiced at the same time. Um, the antibiotics are capable of being very, very good, or they're capable of causing havoc with the body. And the reason being for this is, in the environment, there are species of bacteria, fungal, viruses, protozoas, all of them. They're in every nook and cranny, here, 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 here. They're around everywhere. And they're, each of them have a, a function. They perform uh, you know, tear down of foods and nutrition. They eat, or they're scavengers. They each have a purpose. God didn't make these things for no reason at all. They all had a purpose. So that keeping in mind, we would basically die if these bacteria died, including things like E. coli, uh, Clostridium, all the bacteria that we see as being harmful to man when they get inside of our bodies. Well, believe it or not, they're already inside your body. The key is whether or not you can fight it off, and we're going to go into a little bit more about that as well. Um, in your intestinal mucosa, and that's a little lining, uh, feet and feet of uh, lining that you have in your, what are, is also known as your intestines, small intestines, and then into your large intestines and colon. We have in the, we have fluids and bacteria that line these, uh, this intestinal mucosa lining. Per milliliter, and that's like about, uh, what, fifth of the teaspoon? We have over at least 100 billion of these different type of bacteria in that milliliter of fluid in the intestinal mucosa lining. So when a doctor tells you to go grab a yogurt a day after an antibiotic, it would only take you about 10,000 years to make up the bacteria that that one week's worth of antibiotic will destroy in that seven day period of time. So we're going to get a little further into that. Um, Bacteria inside of us, uh, in our bowel, throughout our body, they communicate, and they're communicators in the body. They let you know when something's not quite right. And the intestines are, a lot of physicians are now, well, naturopathic doctors particularly, this is called a second brain. And we always never, th we never thought too much about what went on here other than breaking down of food and all of that. Now we know that 80% of if not more, of our immune system is here, our serotonin production is here, our ability to um, digest, break down nutrients, I mean, it goes on and on and on. And we have four to 500 different types of species of these bacteria within us that are very beneficial and necessary for life. Some lay on the top of the intestines, some on the bottom. They each like their particular, some lay on the colon. They each like their particular environment and they grow and are very beneficial to us. They keep us healthy. What happens when we go into antibiotics is those antibiotics destroy these good bacteria, not just billions, trillions upon trillions of these good bacteria. And long-term disease issues are most likely primarily related to the destruction of these bacteria caused by antibiotics, chemicals, and other things as well. But antibiotics are probably 
90% of the reason why we end up with these um, problems uh, with floor levels in the, back, in the bowel. Um, it's kind of funny. Most people, and I'll give you a perfect example. A friend of mine's husband went to help me go down and pick up my son's car. And uh, he, we found out the next day, had pneumonia in my car, hacking and coughing away. He's a smoker, and I just kind of thought, eh, well, you know, he's smoking too much. And I have, um, I'm kind of lung compromised. And so that being the case, if I would go by the standard germ theory, which Louis Pasteur uh, go, went by, and, and uh, he was the person that had recommended the pasteurization of all milk, um, he, he pretty much held that God had it wrong. And that basically whenever we get exposed to these bacteria or viruses or fungals, that they were going to infect us. Hey, and unless we're vaccinated or we try to kill them off or wash them off or all of this, um, that basically bottom line is we're going to get the germ or the disease. Obviously, I'm standing here in front of you today. Mm, what, 10 days later? I don't have pneumonia. I don't have a cold. I don't have a sinus infection. I have nothing. They found... Very similarly, polio, the same way. Most people were carrying polio viruses on them, around them, nasal-wise and everything, but 90% of the people never showed any symptoms or reacted. So I tend to go by, and I think most natural doctors and some of the physicians nowadays are going by the second theory, which is not the germ theory. Pierre Bichamp, I probably said that wrong. You're not supposed to pronounce the, the P in, the, in French. These good bugs, these bacteria, the viral fungals and all of themselves, they're not the cause of the disease. What happens is, is when the body gets in the disease state caused by bad diet, chemicals, antibiotics, all the other drugs that throw on the tons of side effects and imbalances in the body, the body becomes imbalanced. It can't identify friend from foes. You don't have adequate bacteria to prevent salmonella, all those wonderful things. E. coli bacteria form in the bladder because you've been on, uh, you know, for me, I was on a lot of antibiotics for bladder infections. No more because I know what to do. But the point being is, is it gets you in a state where you're so imbalanced that you continue to be sick and anything that comes near you, you'll get sick. So the key from bacteria and, and I think this is where people really need to look at is you've got to be in a healthy, balanced state. Otherwise, you're going to be a victim. There is no doubt about that. And as you watch our other shows, you know, we address the diet, nutrition, and things. Pay attention to that. That's very, very important uh, that you maintain that balanced, fit state so that you don't get the pneumonia next to, when you're sitting next to the guy in the movie theater caught hacking away during the movie. Um, Antibiotic toxicity. Now, you know, you'll read the labels when you take your antibiotic, and it'll tell you all the side effects and the things that can happen to you. And uh, you would be surprised how very common um, <laughs> reactions are. In about 10% mm, of the cases, somewhere in that, there is um, an allergic reaction to an antibiotic. And in a smaller fraction, you get anaphylactic shock. Now, anaphylactic shock is deadly. Okay, and I'm that way with penicillin. I'll have an anaphylactic, my start closing up, my, I get itchy, scratchy, I can't breathe, and if it went to too many extremes, if I had too many uh, antibiotic exposures, I would die. So people have that to peanuts and things like that. So because remember, penicillin and uh, some of these others, depending on the, whether it's a po attacking positive gram or negative gram bacteria, um, they originally came from mold. You know, and you're shooting yourself full of mold and taking things that are penicillin derived. And so that being the case, um, you can anaphylactically react and respond to them. Diarrhea and colitis. And this is probably the number one problem that we're dealing with when we're talking about the pre prescription or prescribing of antibiotics. 125 to 22.2% in this London study found that people who take antibiotics on eh, once or twice a year, you know, not all the time, but you're taking, or people who take it for all, I have doctors who put patients on it and say you're on it for a lifetime, and I'm horrified because I know what they do, and they destroy everything that's here and leave the patients wide open. But 
When you have this high of percentage that you're going to develop and lose that much bacteria that your body's rejecting it, it's time to take a second look. They had a lot of issues out of Haiti when they were giving extremely strong antibiotics of people dying from anaphylactic and from this extreme amount of colitis and basically they would have so much diarrhea they would dehydrate and die. So, you know, choose your friend or your foe. Ulcers in the esophagus and intestinal lining. So a lot of what we might be seeing with ulcers may be being caused by these antibiotics instead of excessive stomach acid secretion. Think about that for a moment. If you've taken an antibiotic or you have an H. pylori bacteria and you take an antibiotic, hmm, causes ulcers, I'm trying to treat an ulcer. I wonder if this wouldn't be giving you a chronic issue. This has to be exposed and the risk factors have to be discussed. I'm not saying not to do antibiotics, but I'm telling you, you have the right to know all the risk factors involved in taking them. I'm not going to discuss today any of the natural alternatives, but they exist. Malabsorption of nutrients due to destruction of good bacteria in the bowel. That includes vitamin K, vitamin B5, the list goes on and on. You can't break down your food, you get sick, you get in a diseased state, and eventually you die an early, very painful death full of autoimmune issues and everything else. And that's not how I want to go, okay? So, recognizing that side effect. Severe hearing loss, particularly in children. Chronic skin infections. Now, th are they estimated between 25 and 33.8% of the cases of severe hearing loss were due to antibiotic and antifungal drugs, okay? So, for those kids out there who have chronic ear infections, we better, by God, make sure that that's a bacterial infection because there were studies done, and I'll point this out further on, actually, I'll point it out now, that basically said that antibiotics, when you know it's a viral infection, do nothing to prevent secondary infections in the survival rate and the illness of people. So I'm hearing all the time, oh, I'm giving this to prevent a secondary infection. The studies say it don't work. As a matter of fact, you make viruses and every, fungals and everything grow worse. So that's why a lot of times when you're being handed an a, a, a antibiotic for an upper respiratory infection or a sinus viral infection, it doesn't work. 90% of the cases are viral or fungal based, not bacterial. And basically what the pediatrics associations say, we need to look into the infections further. We need to culture the throats. I mean, we need to do things to find out for sure whether or not these are bacterial infections before we start giving antibiotics that come with their side effects. The pediatric associations are the only, or the pediatric, um, particularly the, um, the medical journal that they have, it's called Pediatric, is probably one of the very few medical journals that's addressing this issue. Perfect example of this, my uh, now 19-year-old son when he was two, he was given multiple antibiotic prescriptions. Oh, hard to th talk about this when he was two years old for uh, ear infections. He ended up with it turned intestinal intestines and they had to cut him open. He was hospitalized for a week to tie down his in intestines because the antibiotics had destroyed all of his good bacteria in his bowels by the time they were done with him. And that's what the pediatric surgeon told me. So, personal experience, I can speak this and I lived it. So, think about it. 10% um, of acute renal failures, kidney failures, are due to antibiotic, neg gram-negative uh, antibiotics. 10%. Think about that. Kidney failure, dialysis, short life. Liver damage, including jaundice, hepatitis, and false hepatitis, um, uh, when, you, when you do testings. Um, acute pancreatitis, tetracycling in, in particular. And when you're talking about use of tetracycling under any circumstances with pregnant women, no way, no how, unless you end up with a certain type of dwarfism in limbs and that type of thing. You pregnant ladies out there, if you go on an antibiotic, you do it as last resort and never a tetracycling based upon the research that's done. Neurotoxic disorders. Injection of antibiotics showed to increase the risk of phlebitis in up to 18% of the patients that got the injections, particularly in the hospitals. Phlebitis, blood clots, hmm, interesting. It's probably to help keep away all the, um, the uh, heavy amount of super infections that are going on uh, in the hospitals right now. 
Routine prescribing, as I mentioned in the Pediatrics Journal, in 1975, so what is that, uh, 35 years ago we knew about this, and yet we keep giving more and more antibiotics. We have to take a look at these, find alternatives, research alternatives. Food supply, full of it. The federal government just came out last week saying, you know, I think we might have some antibiotic res you know, residues and all that in our meat, um, in our beef. We, we may have to look at this. Not another word. So they're just now looking at this when we know our meats are full of antibiotics, growth hormones. I'll tell you, we have a, a local oncologist, and I won't say the name, that told one of my patients, and she's a breast cancer survivor, that if she didn't do organics, she would be a fool. So they know, because he's treating cancers all day long. No antibiotics, organics whenever you possibly can. Eat meat that's grass-fed, antibiotic, and hormone-free. Build your immune system. Alkali your blood. We talk about the diets continually. Lots of vegetables. Sugars feed yeast. Sugars feed bacteria. Staph, E. coli. That junk food diet, and you wonder, and you come into my store, and you say, well, I don't feel good. I'm not healthy. And then I look at your diet, and I'm like, we got some changing to do here. So. Examine your diet, examine your lifestyles, alcohol, all that wonderful stuff. Recognize the ramifications of doing antibiotics and research the alternatives. Next, we're going to be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you very much. Welcome to the fitness portion of our show, and once again, I'm on the floor. Um, you get down on a comfortable, carpeted, nice, soft um, floor, something that's going to give you firm support, um, and kind of in a neutral position as much as you can, holding your abdominals kind of tight and pushing your back into the ground itself. You bring your hands up to a near parallel position along with your head up. Now what we're going to work on is we're going to work on the core part of the body. And so hands out, feet up, and this is called the hundred. This is a Pilates move that works, gosh, if you can look at me, just about every part of the body because everything eventually will get very tight. And as I'm doing a hundred breaths, because hmm, I can do it, but if you got to work up to it, you work up to it. You tr start with 15 breaths relieve it. A lot of people aren't going to have the neck strength to be able to hold that up, but remember, we want some neck strength. Now, if you've got neck problems, back issues, you know, we don't got a lot of motion here, but we do have holding um, muscle and erectors. So, looking straight forward, counting for 100 breaths, great Pilates move for core strength. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you very much. Welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today, with his words of wisdom, Ralph Turciano. And thank you for that intro. Well, sometimes we confused, a little bit of blurry vision, lack of balance. Well, researchers at Loyal University came up with a possible reason for sometimes these unexplained things, including seizures. You'll like this one. Know the word neurocystic cirrhosis. Otherwise, what it is, is tapeworm. Where? in the brain. How common is it? Well, if you're in the border states, or basically uh, indigenous to Mexico, you're looking at about up to 10% of the population, or I should say 1 in 10, have become infected with tapeworm in the brain. And yes, the seizures can be harsh. Some people can live with it a long period of time and never know they have ever had it. But when the seizures do hit, if they do hit, and about 70% of the people that have tapeworm of the brain, it's pretty severe. So if you have things going on, confusion, lack of balance, encephalitis from time to time, headaches, seizures, blurry vision, and it doesn't seem to be a good reason why it's there or 
or it arrived and you never had it before in your life, but you've been traveling to areas where basically the sanitation is not the best, look into that. It's something to actually pay attention to. Otherwise, you'll be medicated your entire life for something that may be a chance of them clearing up one way or the other. And it is, it is, or I should say, does travel just through contaminated water. You do not have to eat pork or raw pork or something along those lines or come in contact with feces or whatever. You can actually just connect to, to it just by basically having a dirty hand put in your mouth. So, something to look for, neurocystic cirrhosis, tapeworm of the brain. But otherwise, no other way to put it. Outside of that, you ever hear about people saying if you reduce your calories, your metabolism seems to slow down, and often medically they'll say, well, just eat less. Well, they found out diet alone does not necessarily help with weight loss. How'd they find this out? Well, they took a group of monkeys, and obviously, and what they did is they overfed them. They overfed them for quite some time. And then they reduced their calories down by about 30%, looking for weight loss. One group of monkeys, basically, they did with exercise, don't ask me how they trained them. Another group of monkeys, they did no exercise. And this came out of Oregon Health and Science University. And it's also, you'll find it printed in the April edition of the American Journal of Physiology. What they found out was just by reducing the calories, after 30 days, they had virtually no significant weight loss. In fact, their energy levels actually went down. Then, after two months, still, no significant weight loss in the group which was not exercising and their energy levels went even lower to the point of being almost like to a, uh, what you would consider a chronic fatigue and the metabolism began to slow and they said quote unquote this study demonstrates that there is a natural body mechanism which conserves energy in a, re in a response to reduction to calories so this does mean it is not just about the amount of calories taken in. You want to lose weight, just reduce those calories down. It means requires a little bit of physical activity added to that. The body is made to move. If it senses it's starving, it will slow everything down. We know that, and that's been confirmed again from Oregon Health and Science University. And outside of that, something we knew in the health industry for a long period of time, but again, this time it's been reconfirmed by the American Association for Cancer Research, the 101st annual meeting this year. Vitamin and calcium supplements do, or they should say may, reduce breast cancer risk. By how much is a good question. Well, they found out calcium reduced breast cancer risk by as much as 40%. Now keep in mind, this is done up to the point of what's called DNA repair. Once DNA repair is maxed out, the calcium offers no additional benefit outside of that. So if someone's already at max DNA repair capacity, the calcium will help, but only to a certain point. The vitamin supplements, regardless of the body's ability to repair its own DNA, reduce breast cancer risk 30% all of the time, period. And so again, this was from the American Association for Cancer Research. They said, Vitamin supplements appear to reduce the risk of breast cancer by about 30%. Calcium supplements reduced 40%. After controlling for the level of DNA repair capacity, calcium supplements were no longer as protective, but the link between vitamin supplements and breast cancer reduction remained. So all those naysayers out there, which like to offer their non-scientific opinion that vitamins don't make a difference in your body and your life, well, these naysayers, or whoever you want to call them, they have to start paying attention to the science. Scientists confirm it does. The propaganda against it, I have no clue where it comes from. Outside of that, coming from Japan, and this is in the Journal of the American Heart Association. And I'm trying to figure it out, it was published at the Osaka University. They found out that eating more foods or consuming more B6, B12, and folic acid significantly reduce the risk of heart disease. How much? Is this like a little tiny study? No, it's a big study. The Japanese researched 23,119 men and 35,611 women over 14 years. So this is not so some backwoods study. And they said, quote unquote, they were so associated with significantly fewer deaths from heart failure significantly 
fewer deaths from stroke, heart disease, and total, total cardiovascular disease in both men and women. Now, is the B6 in the folic acid more so than the B12? But more confirmation in regard to doing these vitamin supplements. To follow that up, vitamin K. Now, mark my words. Watch two or three years from now, vitamin K will be your next vitamin D in the news because we're critically low in a lot of different areas. Well, vitamin K, and this was done from the American Association for Cancer Research in regards to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I bring this up because we're seeing a lot of it. Vitamin K reduced the incidence of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma up to 45%. Yeah, 45%. And that's a huge amount just for one single micronutrient. They said, quote, these results are proactive since they are the first work to be done in connection between vitamin K and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And this is a fairly strong protective effect. And it did work with supplements also, but not mega doses of vitamin K and I would not recommend that anyway since it is a coagulant. But with good, simple vitamin K, the supplementation, from a supplement, not in high doses, or eating a vitamin K rich diet. Again, another nutrient breakthrough and watch vitamin K in the news as time goes on. Now, to tie in with probiotics. An article that came out just recently, uh, basically from the University of Montreal, said why are allergies increasing? Well, again, they said, quote, this is an inverse relationship between the level of hygiene and the incidence of allergies and autoimmune diseases, said Dr. De La Pesci. I'm probably pronouncing his name wrong, I'm doing the best I can here. The most sterile, the more sterile the environment of a child lives in, the higher the risk he or she will develop allergies or an immune problem in their lifetime. Also, another real important reason why your kids should be outside playing and being exposed to the environment. In 1980, 10% of the Western population suffered from allergies. Today, and this is not too long ago, it's only about 30 years. Today, 30% of our population now suffers from autoimmune dysfunction or allergies. One out of every 10 children is said to be asthmatic now, and the mortality rate is increasing by 28% just between 1980 and 1994. Guess what Dr. Lussie's solution was? To not being exposed to these good beneficial bacteria. He said, simply, consuming probiotics or beneficial bacteria during pregnancy could help reduce the allergies in a child. I'm kind of wrapping this up to make it kind of fast. So, when someone is pregnant, instead of a prenatal, they may want to also recommend they also take a probiotic too. What a simple way to produce allergies and autoimmune conditions. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. Thank you very much for joining our show. Do your research. We appreciate you joining us. Have a good day.